Hello, I'm Nito Cobain. Welcome to Side by Side. My guest today will teach us a very important lesson about life and living, how to be a more compassionate, more caring human being. She has just written a book exploring the friendship of former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune, the daughter of a former slave who started a university. Her book shows how civility and inclusion are possible realities for us all. Today we'll meet veteran educator and noted motivational speaker, Dr. Kamisha Whitaker. Funding for Side by Side with Nito Cobain is made possible by... Here's to those that rise and shine, to friendly faces doing more than their part, and to those who still enjoy the little things. You make it feel like home. Ashley Home Store. This is home. The Bud Group is a company of everyday leaders making a difference by providing facility solutions through customized janitorial, landscape, and maintenance services. Coca-Cola Consolidated is honored to make and serve 300 brands and flavors locally. Thanks to our teammates. We are Coca-Cola Consolidated, your local bottler. Dr. Whitaker, welcome to Side by Side. You live in North Florida. You are a significant member of the faculty at Bethune-Cookman. You've written a marvelous book. I want to ask you about it in a moment. And you talk so much about civility. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of civility? Well, first, Dr. Cobain, thank you so much. I am absolutely delighted to be here with you and to be on this Side by Side program. Civility, everybody is talking about it these days and calling for it. Uh, the formal definition is always politeness, right? But in the book in particular, I talk about civility as intentional respect for another human being. It is the how we communicate with other people. Mm -hmm. Communication is really the foundation of whether or not we practice civility. So it's effective communication on the interpersonal level, and then we can go to groups and organizations um, as you'd like. But it's about respect, mutual respect and understanding for another's position. Mm -hmm. How does one become an intentionally civil human being? Are there disciplines one must learn? Are there skills one must develop? Mm -hmm. Are there biases one must uh, get rid of? Mm -hmm. Very good question. The truth is, in, in order to be intentional, we have to be, of course, thoughtful consider the other person. Mm. And by considering the other person, not necessarily how I want the other person to behave or react, but how might they behave or react or respond if I communicate with them in a specific way. If civility is the outcome that you're looking for, then what you give out should, should possibly reflect that outcome that you're seeking. Mm -hmm. So if I want the person to respond in a courteous way, not necessarily, it doesn't, civility doesn't mean that the person can't disagree, right? C civility can mean that we disagree. So we don't have to lock hands and walk hand in hand, but we can walk side by side because we're respectful of each other's side differences. Side. Yes. This is copyrighted. <laughs> oh. You owe us a royalty <laughs> already. <laughs> Somehow we'll get it covered. Yeah, okay. Yes. But, where, but where, were you, where were you born and where were you raised? I was born originally in Jamaica, the little island of Jamaica, yeah. raised in Jamaica, but I've spent most of my life in the United States. Came here as an international student to study communication. At Bethune-Cookman? No, I started at City University of New York and then transferred to Bethune-Cookman. And then you went to American University? Went to American in University in Washington, D.C. and earned a master's there in communication and also studied at Regent University in Virginia Beach and did a Ph.D. in organizational and interpersonal communication. Yes, yes. You've had a celebrated life. You've made a lot of uh, your influence and impact are, are felt by many and, and praised by more. Um, so... You talk about communication, you're an expert on communication. Is there a difference between communicating with someone and connecting with someone? Absolutely. Anyone can just speak words. But I'll give you an example. Well, no, let me just say this. Anyone can just say words. We, we all communicate, right? Mm -hmm. But communication is far greater than just saying words or gestures. It is about the intention. People look for whether or not you're genuine when you communicate. It's the body language, it's the eyes, it's your hands, whether they move or not move, but it's really the intention. If mm -hmm. people can feel 
and sense that you care mm -hmm. in how you communicate about what you do. Yes, and what is, what is the secret to understanding whether someone feels mm -hmm. what you're saying? By sincerely asking whether people connect with your message or not. Uh, it doesn't matter if I feel that I have done a good job speaking in front of an audience or even with you. It matters how you respond and the feedback that I get from the person who is the recipient of the communication. Mm -hmm. You look for that audience feedback because I am not thrilled by the sound of my own voice. I am thrilled as a communicator when other people are impacted positively by how I've conveyed the message to them. You, you're known as a crisis management uh, consultant mm -hmm. and educator. Mm -hmm. How does one define a crisis and what are the first two or three steps that you take to identify what it is, define it, and then come up with alternative solutions to how have positive outcomes? Crisis can be of any kind. I've worked with nonprofit organizations, churches, schools, businesses, you name it. But crises, how I define a crisis, anything that can compromise your integrity or how you're perceived in the world, different from how you determine it to be so, mm. right? Reputation. Reputation. It's yes. about reputation management, really. Yes. But let's be clear, we don't just want to avert a misrepresentation of reputation. We want that reputation that we're protecting to be the actual representation of your reputation. Accurate with who you are, what you do, Absolutely. what you stand for. Absolutely. So how do you solve when you're faced with a crisis? You have to identify the crisis, of course, figure out who is involved and how you can get to tell the truth. Mm. Danny Davis wrote a book, he said, tell the truth, tell it early. Telling the truth matters, being honest about why you're facing what you're facing, even if it's personal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't want to divulge some of those personal things about us, but sometimes it is absolutely critical in a crisis to tell people who are impacted by the crisis that you're in the why and how much you care about solving, the, solving it to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. It's not about us. To be effective in communication, to be effective in crisis management or communication, it's about the other person. It's not self-centered work. So the first step is to define what is it. That's right. What's the second step? The second step is to identify who the parties are and how you can actually work with those parties to solve the crisis, to meet their needs. So you're doing some investigative kinds of work, right? What's the methodology here? How do I go about it? And what mediums can I use to communicate the key message to get me out of this crisis? Mm -hmm. So then the third part is constructing the message and delivering it to the audience. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you deliver it to the audience? Let's say it's a, let's take an example of a company that has a, an abuse, misuse, uh, overuse of some policy. Sure. And it caused some reputational damage. Sure. Or let's say it's something like technology entered into the zone mm -hmm. and created uh, interference with private information and sure. so on. And now the company is burdened mm -hmm. with the notion of responsibility right. that somehow they were not as responsible as they could. Mm -hmm. How do you then, to a large audience, communicate the message of resolution? First, if you're the CEO, you never send just the PR person out front. Mm. You tackle that yourself. Mm -hmm. If people want, if, if you want people to know that you care about them care about their business, and this is breach of their information. You want to tackle that, address that yourself. Mm -hmm. Let them know that their information matters to you and what you're going to do if you're determined to fix that, that it won't occur again. Mm -hmm. But honesty is the best policy in communication. And of course, as broad a message, do it on camera, do it perhaps unscripted, because the unscripted, the better more natural, mm -hmm. um, particularly for people who are not experts in communication. We have all these strategic communication uh, experts and they're writing scripts and writing talking points for our CEOs. But the number one thing when I counsel a CEO or any program director, the number one thing I tell them is, people want to know you. If, if this is who you are in the mm. crisis, fine. But some of them are not good communicators. No, they're not. So you have to script them, but they have to, in a way, convey themselves. So one of the best ways to do that, have a conversation similar to the way we're having mm -hmm. one. If you're unable to come across as naturally as you'd like on camera by yourself in a cold room, then have a conversation, talk to the employees and tape that and send to the media. Mm -hmm. But don't ever try to cover up the crisis, bury the crisis, 
tell the truth about the crisis and how you intend to solve it and solve it quickly and well for the best good of all involved. Well, what, what keeps leaders from standing up and standing out when there's a crisis? Always fear and money, the loss of money, yeah. right? Usually it's fear. Afraid to lose fear. their jobs? Afraid or? to lose their jobs, afraid to lose uh, their reputation, uh, particularly if it's well known broadly. Uh, people are concerned about themselves. Mm -hmm. But when you're facing a crisis as an executive or just as an individual, moms face crises, families face crises, uh, all kinds of organizations face crises. But is it your crisis or is it the crisis of those who are being impacted? Mm. That's the question to ask. Mm -hmm. So it's less self-centered. Yes, it is your crisis to some degree, but how can I turn this crisis into an opportunity? For example, the crisis that's occurring right now at historically black colleges and universities. Uh, we know there have been bombs. bomb threats yes. and all kinds. In fact, I'm coming from Bethune-Cookman, yes. where there was a bomb threat at really? the 1st of February. What causes that? And what is locked, it? locked down. Well, fear, to incite fear and to cause, you know, stir up anger and hate and bitterness and vitriol that we see on television and are all of that. these crazy people? Is Some this, of them are is crazy. Is this politically motivated? Is it just people who have mental illness or... It's enormous amount of, of discriminatory bias? It, it's a number of things, I think. I, I don't think it's just one uh, issue that people face. I think it's biases. Um, I think some people are mentally unwell. But I also think, you know, when we stir up controversy, particularly when we politicize these issues, mm -hmm. they get out of control. But that may seem like a crisis, right? Bomb threats all over the country. That's a good crisis that you could you know, use as a case study. Not a good event, but a good mm. crisis to analyze. One of the things I would tell all those HBCU leaders, and I was looking for, who is going to stand up and say, though people are threatening the foundations of why these institutions were created, if you are not in alignment with the people who are threatening us, what can you do to shore up these institutions to ensure that they can mitigate these kinds of threats in the future. Mm -hmm. I would compel people to give, to support the ideals that these institutions stand upon and mm -hmm. their missions. That's mm -hmm. what I would do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of HBCUs, I'm very involved with a national task force to help HBCUs. Um, uh, I have many, many friends who are who are presidents at HBCUs. Sometimes the question does come up. Sure. HBCUs appeal specifically to uh, students of, of color. Uh, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Can we amalgamate society a little different? Um, a lot of private schools and public schools that are predominantly um, Caucasian schools uh, have, to have a challenge in terms of attracting uh, students of color, right? Because they're competing with organizations that have strength and foundation and history in HBCUs. Do, do you, am I right, am I wrong? Do you see, do you see um, um, a reason and power in keeping that culture and history and, and uh, you know, strength of personhood versus merging and purging so all of us can have more, you know, encounters with each other. So t tell me where I'm right, where I'm wrong. Here is where I think you're right. Diversity matters. Representation matters, both at a PWI, predominantly white institutions, and at a historically black college or university. They were founded, yes, before the civil rights era and to give opportunities to students of color who did not otherwise have those opportunities. So that was the relevance. But people attend HBCU now for cultural reasons, mm. to, because they feel a sense of nurturing and care. That's what the research says right now. And so there is a sense that they want to be represented. They want to be taught by people who look like them and to experience that kind of extension of their home and family. There is a place for that. But there is also a case to be made for the mixing. Yes. I think HBCUs now need to do a better job of attracting people from all races, all ethnicities. They're not limited, and that message needs to go out. They've never limited or restricted different cultures or backgrounds to enter these institutions. And PWIs now can do a better job as well of opening up the opportunities for um, students who are non-traditional or students from other ethnicities. Mm -hmm. But I think we all need to be committed to diversity. Here's the thing about representation, though. Uh, representation doesn't mean that the person has to look like me or come from my background. So uh, the student can be of African-American descent and go to a white institution. Uh, they don't have to have a black professor to know that that professor cares. 
because that professor is leading from a culture of care and civility. Yes. That's what it is. So, so I'm, I'm an advocate for civility and diversity and inclusion. I, I love people, particularly people from all different backgrounds. I've always loved what diversity fosters, mm -hmm. what you learn from other people with different backgrounds and different interests. And so I know that just like in the book, Mary McLeod Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt, An Unusual Friendship, their friendship, their unusual interracial friendship was not just a model for what you can achieve then, it's a model for what we can achieve now. Mm -hmm. If we practice the same kind of diversity intentionally, in our schools, in our churches, in our communities, and in our homes. And politics and media play a big part of that. Mm -hmm. It's often politicized, you know, and, and here it is right now, the, 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 the hot issue is critical race theory. There's a place for that, Dr. Kobe. There's a place for that. Some people are uncomfortable talking about critical race theory. I think the institution, the academy, higher ed, K through 12, all of those institutions are the best places to have the conversation. What we need to do is figure out how we approach the conversation mm. from a pedagogical perspective, right? So the best place to wrestle with tough issues is still the academy, is still in a classroom where it can be properly monitored and, and people can be, feel free and safe to express their different opinions. So I say it's not about the theory, it's about whether or not we can promote civility as we're communicating any difficult subject, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. Whether we agree or not. Whether we agree or not. Yeah. Which brings me to conflict resolution. You're an expert on conflict resolution. We talked about crisis management. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about conflict resolution. Conflict resolution, again, is about what is your outcome. We all have different ways to solve conflict. We, we, some people want to avoid conflict. Some people want to mitigate conflict, but conflict is bound to happen just like change is bound to happen. When conflict arises, the number one thing you have to identify is why. Why the it happened? Cause, the the cause. cause. What caused this conflict? And if you are responsible, how can I remedy this? How can I remedy this? How can I communicate that I care about the fact that I've injured another party or someone has uh, been aggrieved because of my actions? So cause, and then of course, impact. How do I ensure that this does not happen again? Or how do I ensure that we redirect this conflict into change yes. or activities for social causes? Yes. Let's talk about your book a little bit. What attracted you to these two women to the degree that you would write a book? I know that this was part of your dissertation yeah. for a doctoral uh, program, um, but then you decided to write a book about two women. What, what was the primary attraction? Yes, now, uh, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, daughter of former slaves, she was the first one of 17 born free. Uh, in the book, I, I refer to her as the National Park Service does as the first lady of the struggle. And I refer to, of course, Eleanor Roosevelt as the first lady uh, of the world, as she was known. Two of the greatest women of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, I was attracted to write the story about them because I wasn't satisfied that the dissertation would reach as many people as it needed yes, to. Yes. I needed to convey not just the fact that these two historical figures had a friendship, but I needed to convey the depth of that friendship. Many people say it was just political. But from my research, I found that it was more than just political. It became a close bond. Mary McLeod Bethune referred to it as a kinship mm -hmm. uh, between them. Eleanor Roosevelt said it was deep and abiding. How did they meet each other and what, what span of time are we talking about? They met each other in 1927, uh, did not communicate via letters until 1933, but the span of their friendship was about 28 years, almost three decades. And how did they meet? Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's mother-in-law introduced them at a, an event being held for prominent women who were leading organizations. How old was Mary Bethune at the time? She was 52 and Eleanor Roosevelt was 43. Okay, and has she already started uh, a school? She'd already started Bethune-Cookman, an educator in her own right. So, so and take, me, take me back to that. I mean, this is, a, this is a woman who came through a difficult time, a difficult background mm -hmm. and she started a university yes how did she do that <laughs> the story is told that she started you know as I said 15 uh, of 17 children she was the one born free she was the first one of 17 children born free not too far from here in Maysville South Carolina she started the school with five little girls a dollar and a half and faith in God but I always say I add and so much more 
because by the time she had gotten to Daytona Beach, she had lived experiences of discrimination and mm -hmm. segregation and all of it, but she was passionate because she was the first one in her family who was taught how to read. Mm -hmm. And so she always wanted to help other people discover mm -hmm. uh, education. She believed education was the salvation of the race. Mm -hmm. And so they knitted together not just because they were from contrasting genealogies. It, from contrasting genealogies, one born into wealth, the other one born into abject poverty, you would have thought during a time of racial tension, much like it is now, all kinds of the depression era, uh, economic crisis, much like it is now, you would think it would be unlikely for them to get together, yes. but not so, because they were shared interests. They bonded because they believed in the power of education. They wanted to see the marginalized improve their conditions. They wanted women to have more respect in the world. And they wanted a better country, a better world. Both of them ended up collaborating on the, the, the UN uh, Declaration of, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's how far and how impactful that friendship was between mm -hmm. Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary mm -hmm. Bethune. Where did Cookman come into the picture? Okay, Cookman was a, named after a school in Jacksonville. Reverend Alfred Cookman was the name of that school. And when Mary McLeod Bethune uh, contacted the United Methodist Church, uh, they agreed that if they would give her some money for her school, if she merged some of those interests and became co-educational. So see. she had males now joining the all-female school in Daytona Beach, and it became Bethune-Cookman uh, University, Bethune-Cookman College at the time. Daytona Normal Industrial Institute, really. It's a university now. Yes, it's a university today. Give us some stats. How many students? Uh, and... About 2,800 students, over 150 faculty from all over the world, just premier faculty that serve there. And the student body is diverse. Uh, that, Quite a few international students, at least 8% international students uh, from all, all different countries. Uh, state of the art uh, programs in communication and hospitality. Undergrad and grad. Undergrad and grad, graduate program in transformative leadership. Mm. We, need, we could use some transformative leadership <laughs> yes. today. But just a fine institution that really represents the best mm -hmm. of what Mayor McLeod Bethune would and have wanted today. And you teach there, and you also direct the Innovation Center. Yes, I actually do. I'm the director for faculty innovation at Bethune Cookman, and do quite a bit of professional development work with our scholars there, ensuring that we have the best pedagogical practices to reach yeah. our students today. You know, uh, Kamisha, what, what sometimes worries me is. Mm that faculty go to school sometimes seven, eight, ten years, mm -hmm. uh, earn their PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, they're taught in, in the discipline itself all matters that make them expert. However, they're not taught how to teach, although they aspire to teach. They're not taught how to develop life skills, which is today, um, you know, um, a very important matter that, that, that employers tell us, please give me graduates who are coachable, give me ones who have life skills, don't give me ones who just understand the technical knowledge, the academic piece of it. Uh, I assume in the Innovation Center you are attacking some of those issues and attempting to overcome some of those challenges. Absolutely. In fact, we just had an institute uh, with over 30 plus concurrent sessions and brought in Christopher Emden and we brought in um, another scholar, um, oh, I forget his name at the moment, but we brought in quite a few scholars to talk about innovation. But one of the things when we're talking about pedagogical kinds of things and faculty members must continuously submit themselves to learning and yes. growth and industry. Yes. If we're not connected to the industries that we want to put these young people in, exactly. or we want to see them excel in, exactly. then wh what good is it? Gone are the days when faculty members, you know, just you know, read from the lecture. Uh, you really have to do life with your students. No question. You but have how do they know to do that? Right. If that, someone has never that. run a business, for example, yes. but is teaching business courses, mm -hmm. how do you overcome this suspicion among parents that? Uh, I'm paying all that money, but you're not really giving my child what he or she needs for a prosperous life, successful life with significance. Sure. So what you do is you, 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 that faculty member has to submit to continuous training, really training and professional development. Exposure. Exposure, awareness, awareness in the industry, bringing in professionals, professionals in residence into the classroom. 
it doesn't mean that faculty members always have to go out into industry, but they have to be willing to continuously lend themselves to exposure. Or bring in, Travel abroad. Invite people. Invite to guest speakers, yes. absolutely. But also faculty, the role of faculty developers is also changing. Because sometimes, you know, faculty who are experts don't want to think that they need to develop. I'm an yes. expert. Yes. But are you an expert? The litmus test for that is the product, is the outcome of the, the student. Outcome. Yes. It doesn't matter the effort and your credentials. You know, we can't sit in these ivory towers. We have to get down to our students. I think that's what's important in our institutions. Yes. A great institution, a great professor has to be committed to taking the average student, make them great, the good student, make them excellent, the excellent student, make them extraordinary. Yes. You know what I like about you? You're practical and pragmatic, mm. and you understand the role of education as it relates to life itself. Thank you. As people graduate and go out and do great things. I, I recommend your book to everybody because it's a Thank fascinating you. read about something that one would not ordinarily think would be possible. Yes. So I thank you for being with me side by side, Dr. Thank Kamisha you. Whitaker, and keep on doing good things and planting seeds of greatness thank in you. the minds, hearts, and, and souls of everybody you meet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cobain. Good to be with you today. Funding for Side by Side with Nito Cobain is made possible by... Here's to those that rise and shine, to friendly faces doing more than their part, and to those who still enjoy the little things. You make it feel like home. Ashley Home Store. This is home. The Bud Group is a company of everyday leaders making a difference by providing facility solutions through customized janitorial, landscape, and maintenance services. Coca-Cola Consolidated is honored to make and serve 300 brands and flavors locally. Thanks to our teammates. We are Coca-Cola Consolidated, your local bottler.